Uh, I'm at 500 feet, Mole's up at 23,000 feet. And so we, we're in a perfect bracket formation to find the MiG and, uh, and then prosecute the next attack. And so from 500 feet up, I pass off the left wing of the MiG about 50 feet off of his left wing. So I roll my airplane to the left. We go into what is considered a classic two circle fight. And, and very quickly after about 180 degrees of turn, I am now behind his 3-9 line. I have a lot of heading crossing angle, but I'm behind his 3-9 line and I can drive the fight to my advantage. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I serve Warzone Tours as an Army Attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Cesar Rico Rodriguez, retired Air Force Colonel and former fighter pilot. From the cockpit of an F-15 Charlie, Rico placed himself in rare company by being one of only three pilots with three air-to-air kills since Vietnam. His story begins as a kid from Puerto Rico, takes him to the Citadel and combat operations in Panama, Desert Storm, and Kosovo. I hope you enjoy his story as much as I did. Caesar, thank you so much for, for taking time to share your story with us. Uh, truly my pleasure, Ryan, and thank you. And please call me Rico. Okay, you got it. <laughs> now, I, I interviewed another A-10 pilot, Vince Scherer, and the first question I asked him was about his call sign. But I think that we need to ease into that one from what I understand, because it can be a little sensitive or close to home. So maybe we'll, we'll tee up where Rico comes from uh, a little bit later. Perhaps. Yeah, well, we, we can definitely do that. Mine is not a hard one. It's okay. not a it's it's not a politically unset, uh, uh, incorrect one either. So it's okay. a good thing. Let, well, let's start there then, if you're okay with it. Let's hit let's hit uh, the call sign Rico and then the aircraft behind you. Sure. So uh, uh, Rico came when I got my first operational assignment. Um, uh, I graduated from pilot training in 1981 or 82 is when I graduated, started in 81, uh, went through fighter leading and then went to the A-10 and then went to Korea. And so part of the, 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 what we would call the green bean experience in Korea was upon arrival, you would, uh, you would, uh, the, the squadron would greet you. You got to meet the squadron. And then that afternoon after the flying was over, uh, we would start running uh, to the different bars in the Ville uh, as we moved around. And uh, it just so happened that probably on about the fourth or the fifth bar, uh, one of the uh, the the owners of the restaurant of the, the bar that we were at, um, she came up to me and she says, so, uh, you know, tell me, what's your name? And I said, well, my name is Caesar. And and Caesar um, could could sound like it, like like the uh, like the Roman Caesar with an E.A. or it could be Cesar which is how I generally use it. But in, in, to my American friends and English speakers, I would use Caesar. And so she, she could not enunciate Caesar. It was too hard for her to do that. And she's going, okay, I don't like Caesar. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, hold on a second. My mother gave me this name. How, how can you not like Caesar? It's not an option. It's not an option. And she says, well, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Puerto Rico. And she says, I'm going to call you Rico from here on in. And so for my entire military career, um, even, you know, the naming ceremony is a very uh, big tradition in the fighter squadron and it's kind of extended to other weapon systems uh, in the military. But uh, Caesar turned into Rico and, and ever since then, everybody's always called me Rico. And even now in industry, uh, you know, I have my business card that says Caesar Rodriguez and they're like going, who is this? I know you as Rico, but I don't know who Cesar Rodriguez is. So uh, Rico has stuck and, uh, and, and, and it works out. But that's how Rico came to be. On the spectrum of zero to 10 with how, how um, touchy or personal a call sign can be, is Rico like on the, on the low end of that compared to what some people might have? I presume it can be... It's slightly yeah. different context for, for other call signs. Yeah, yeah. There there would be others that would probably use the initials R I C O as as a as a short version 
for something that somebody really did bad, but they would they would give them the the cover story of Rico, but all of the people who were in the know would say, "Oh, we know why they call you Rico." But mine is truly it was associated with my hometown. Got it. Okay, that's great. Um, wow. and, and so Rico, before we hop into the aircraft here, you you can't believe everything you read online, so you can fact okay. check me on this. Yeah. But you're in rare company, right? I mean, from what I understand, you're one of less than five. I think it's three Americans who have three air-to-air -air combat victories, if that's what you would describe them as, since Vietnam. That's Which correct. It's you in a very small group of people. Um, right place, right time, I would imagine, is part of that. And then a lot of skill that goes along with it. Yeah, I would say right place, right time. Uh, the right level of training, the right level of uh, equipment, uh, and la definitely Lady Luck uh, was on my side. I, I would take it one step further, and again, not part of the bragging club, but of the three of us who have three kills since Vietnam, I'm the only one who's done it in two different combat env environments. So I'm even in another <laughs> group. So I like uh, it. <laughs> I like it. All right. Um, so I want to hear about how you how you found your way to the air to the Air Force, but I would love to hear about the aircraft behind you first. All right, so the aircraft that sits behind me is uh, is 114. Um, she was, uh, I flew her in Desert Storm in 1991. And actually both of the kills that I had in Desert Storm, I was actually flying uh, 114. And we generally never flew the same airplane uh, on any given sequence of sorties. Obviously, you never knew when there was going to be a MIG opportunity or anything like that. Um, but it just so happened that uh, on the 19th and then on the 26th of January 1991, I was flying her. And, uh, and so that's what uh, her first two stars are mine. The only two stars on that jet are mine. Yeah. Well, they're not mine. They're hers because the star stays with the jet. Doesn't, it doesn't fly with the pilot. Uh, when So when I transferred to other bases, I, I didn't get to put two stars under my name. The, the stars stay with the jet, and that's Air Force history. Um, and, so, uh, and so this summer, uh, in the middle of the, the COVID pandemic, um, there, I have a tradition with the, with the squadrons that are flying 114 that generally at least once a year, the squadron sends me a picture a note from the crew chief and a note from the pilot whose name is on uh, on the jet. And so uh, this is the picture that the pilot sent to me uh, because she was flying uh, over Saudi Arabia again. So this was uh, her return back to the AOR. And, uh, and of course, she's gone through some significant modifications. Uh, luckily, a lot of those modifications are Raytheon modifications. She's got a new radar. Uh, she's got a new electronic warfare systems solution on her, obviously flying a very different set of missiles than what we flew in Desert Storm. Um, so that, you know, the airplane, the frame is probably, I'm going to say 70% the same frame that I flew, uh, but the other 30% are upgrades that she's been getting every year or every cycle. Uh, so as to remain relevant in the battle spaces that she's having to operate under. Mm -hmm. oh, amazing. And that's a F-15 Charlie, is that right? At the time? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. F-15 Charlie. And, sure. uh, and so they've done a great job, the squadron and the crew chief, uh, you know, they're all part of the, the collective family of keeping the jet uh, in the air. And uh, so, be, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a bond and, uh, um, and, and so they're keeping her flying. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that at some point, uh, one of those uh, guys or gals who's flying her uh, has the opportunities that I had to engage a MIG and, and take them down. Yeah. Oh, man. And it's a sexy looking aircraft, too. So it is. It's, it's pretty badass. So, um, take, take me back to your life as a kid. I understand your father was an NCO. You moved around a lot as an army brat, I would assume. What got so, you into flying? Tell me about your old man. Yeah, so part of the uh, the, the fact checking is uh, my dad was an officer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was an army officer. He was an air defense uh, officer, served in Vietnam. And uh, I did not know it 
until very late in, in his life uh, that he actually had a, a desire to fly. Uh, when he was at the University of Mayaguez, he saw the Thunderbirds come to uh, uh, Ramey Air Force Base down in Puerto Rico. And, uh, you know, there, we found a picture of him uh, posing next to the Thunderbirds. And, uh, and then little by little, we, I was able to connect the dots. But, you know, my, uh, my aviation piece really kind of came by, uh, um, uh, I would say, both luck and, um, and just chance. Uh, when I went to the Citadel, I started out with, uh, in the Army ROTC program at the Citadel. And then halfway through my sophomore year, um, the school announced to all of the sophomores that the flying qualification exams for Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Army were coming up, and they all happened to be on the same day. Uh, so uh, my roommate, he was he was a, a was continues to be uh, a gung ho Marine. Um, now he's actually a chaplain in the Navy, uh, gung ho chaplain in the Navy, wow. which is a, a another cool story. But uh, <laughs> so he he grabs me and he says, "Dude, let's go take the tests." And uh, I said, "All right." Um, and and we both agreed that we we're going to take all the tests, uh, all all four services, or and uh, and go do the the, the uh, for the Air Force. It was called uh, the AFOQT, and. Um, so, uh, you know, we went and, you know, just like, uh, you know, SATs and ACTs in high school, you know, about an hour into it, you just want to jam pencils in your eyes because you're ready to kill yourself. Um, but, you know, we went through all of them. And then about two or three weeks later, uh, different results started to come back. And it just so happened that I scored very high on the Air Force side and the Air Force uh, very quickly, their ROTC program knocked, tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, dude, you know, how about, uh, you know, coming and join the Air Force, uh, we'll give you a two year scholarship for the rest of your time here at the Citadel. So of course, funds being a, the challenge that they were, I, I jumped on that. And, uh, and the main thing I had to do was uh, stop uh, my, my athletic side of the, the Citadel. Uh, and, and because the, the, uh, the Air Force said, if you encounter any injury, you know, while in college that, that either, you know, causes a surgery or whatever, then you'll lose your, your flying slot uh, wow. at pilot training. So they were very selective about that. So uh, uh, stopped the sports, uh, went into intramural sports, stayed active in that arena, but started to uh, try to figure out what I got myself into. Um, I'd never flown before except on a commercial airline. Um, you know, I'd never really been, you know, a, uh, I wasn't chasing aviation since being a little kid. It was, it just happened. And uh, I saw my senior year, um, you know, part of this uh, qualification to fly is they want you to, to at least get some, some civilian flying time under your belt. And uh, the program included going down to the local beauty in Charleston and uh, you did six sorties to go solo. Um, and then after you solo, you, were, you had about another 10 sorties that you could fly by yourself. And um, so I was kind of lucky. I uh, had a great uh, initial instructor. He, you know, he, he, he took the time to explain, you know, the, this whole concept of uh, departing terra firma uh, on the whim of a little motor and a couple of wings and a tail. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he, you know, after the third sortie, he goes, dude, you know, I can solo you right now. And uh, then you're done. And I go, well, wow. does, does that mean I lose sorties? He goes, well, yeah, then you, your clock starts to count for your solo time. And I said, well, uh, then let's just keep flying. So I flew wow. the full six sorties and then got my solo sorties. And I would just, you know, leave the school, head down to the Muni, check out an airplane, go fly along the Charleston beaches uh, the Charleston Low Country, um, and just kind of get an appreciation for it. I go, okay, this is cool, um, but it definitely was not enough to prepare me for pilot training because uh, pilot training was, uh, you know, I always tell folks that pilot training is is kind of tr like training for a marathon physically because flying a jet is a physically 
demanding activity. And it's also like cramming a, a, a four year bachelor's degree into 11 months. <laughs> it just seemed, it seemed like every, every week you were getting a test, you were getting a simulator uh, evaluation. Um, and so needless to say, my first half of my uh, pilot training experience was not very good. As a matter of fact, my, one of my instructors said, uh, you know, you got to think about something else because I don't think you're going to be a very good pilot. Wow. And I was just kind of like going, holy smoke. So this is uh, not what I wanted. You know, I've committed to it, but I was also not that good. And so I, I really had to find, you know, other ways of, uh, of covering. And it really was more about a little more of a personal commitment to the to the art of flying, uh, recognizing that I didn't have the the natural quote skills. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I upped my game. You know, I spent a lot more time in the simulator. Uh, we used to call it, and I think the, the kids still do today, call it chair flying, where, you know, you kind of simulate where, what are you doing with your hands and your eyes and your feet? And, um, and the second half, when we transitioned from the T-37 to the T-38, uh, things like formation flying, uh, pulling high G maneuvers, things like that, that was that was kind of like more into my uh, my wheelhouse, and then I moved back up uh, up the ladder enough to to qualify to fly fighters uh, coming out of pilot training. What just out of curiosity, why was that more in your wheelhouse? What what did you notice at that time that told you like this is where I should be? When you got into the T thirty eight side, um, it felt more like a team sport. There was a flight leader, like a quarterback. There was a wingman, you know, like a tight end, or, you know, it, it felt like a team sport. Um, and so I could relate to that aspect of working as a team. Um, and, and of course, at, in pilot training, you're not officially, uh, quote, the aircraft commander, because you always have an instructor, you know, either on your airplane uh, in the back seat or in the other airplane. Uh, doing instructor duties but the the instructors would start to give you more rope uh, more rope to show leadership in the air and then that started to kind of play out like a sports event where you know the, you know the, the coach wants you to to take on more responsibility besides the position you're in you know can you be thinking about other things um, you know can you audible uh, those are the things that started to kind of feel right when uh when I was making the transition from T thirty seven to T thirty eights, it felt more like a like a team sport, um, and uh, and so uh, it, that you know I I kind of it, it felt more natural. Yeah, and so you kind of alluded to. It sounds like maybe you were recruited to play a sport at the Citadel initially, maybe. Yeah, yeah, right. When I played. Yeah, played sports, played football and baseball, you know, played those sports all my life. Uh, you know, the, the, the yeah, you're right. So, so you, you get into the Citadel, you get to a great school, you're playing sports, you get aviation, Air Force, you're in training. And then one of your flights, the instructor is like, you may want to think about something else because this isn't right. I assume you didn't have a lot of times where people were telling you you weren't good enough. So, like, how, how did that affect you going forward? That, well, it, that, it, 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 it forced me to to kind of rethink this uh, this this whole commitment that I've I've jumped into, you know. Um, and so uh, and again, it goes back to what I would call uh, personal reflection. Can you debrief yourself to the level that forces yourself to uh, to to make a change? And and for me. Uh, part of that change was I spent more time in the simulator complex. Uh, you know, uh, there might be times when I, you know, head off to the bar and have a couple more drinks or head to the gym and, and lift more weights. Well, boom, took those things kind of, I didn't take them completely out of the picture, but I, I moved them in the, in the priority list of, uh, of what I wanted to be doing um, and started to look at the Air Force uh, as, as a as flying as a career not as a hobby yeah out of curiosity what did your dad say when you switched from army rotc to the air force track 
well, interesting. It, it was, uh, are you sure you know what you're doing? Uh, and I said, yeah, dad, I think this is, this is my, this is where I want to go. And he goes, okay, then, uh, you know, don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> Few words. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, I was the first of my family to, to leave, to go to college in the States. Um, you know, so that was a big deal. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, you know, coming from, uh, from Puerto Rico, a small little town, I was lucky, uh, in the sense that I was raised, you know, bilingual all my life. And so I could go from Spanish to English without quote an accent. Um, you know, I have a lot of my friends who, who couldn't do that. And some of them who came to pilot training later on, you know, they would wash out because of their language skills. Um, because again, it, it's, it, it's, it's different, but it's the same. And so, uh, but yeah, so it, it, it was a big responsibility to, to, to go to college as the first. Um, and then ultimately to, you know, now I'm going to flight school, another semi first, my dad was already an officer. I was following in his footsteps from the standpoint of being commissioned. Uh, but again, um, I didn't know it at that time that, you know, he was, that was one of his, uh, goals. So, uh, I'm, I'm glad I did. Okay. Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, tell me, so you, you end up going with a tens at the time. Was that what you were gunning for was a tens? Were there other options out there? What made you go to that aircraft? I actually, the, the, my class drop had, uh, had F 15 number one. Um, had F-111 as number two and A-10 as number three. And, and so I wanted the F-15, uh, but I wasn't the number one guy in my class. Um, and I really had no idea what the F-111 was all about. Uh, Mission-wise, I could sense uh, a, a slight alignment to, you know, to kind of supporting the Army from an A-10 perspective. And, um, and then again, one of the things I realized when I was going through this T-38 phase, uh, my instructor, Wheels Wheeler, he was a former F-4 driver. He says, dude, you know, you are, you can do single seat fighter mentality work. You, you, you're, you're, you're thinking, your hands, your physical, all, all that is, you know, you, you can do a single seat fighter. And so I really was um, kind of triggered towards uh, you know, going to the single seat world at the time. So the 111, uh, I, I didn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do. So, uh, I, I went after the A-10. Wow. Okay. What a, what a different trajectory, I assume. Now you mentioned you were, you know, you followed your, your old man as an officer. There, there could not have been many people from Puerto Rico in the air force or in your class at the time. How, did you even notice it at the time? What what was that like? I, I assume at the Citadel as well. Probably aren't that many people from Puerto Rico there. Yeah, there was. Uh, we called ourselves the Latinos Unidos at, at the Citadel, and there was probably <laughs> about ten of us uh, from from different uh, Latin countries. Uh, I think there was five of us from Puerto Rico, um, and then in my pilot training class, yeah, I was the only uh, the only kid from Puerto Rico. So. Uh, but you know the the truth was uh, at this stage, and and mostly because of sports, um, I feel that you know sports sports doesn't care about the color of your skin. Uh, it just cares that you're sweating your butt off, you're trying hard, uh, and you're willing to be a team player. And uh, and those are just kind of the skills that I uh, you know uh, I, I kind of took everywhere I went. You know I was going to try hard. I was going to be giving it my best. Um, and if I wasn't my best, then someone's going to, you know, debrief me and help me get better, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, uh, you know, some of the other kids, uh, you know, I know a couple of the guys who ended up washing out of pilot training, uh, in the class behind me, uh, because of their, uh, language skills, you know, yeah. you, you, you literally couldn't, um, when you were in the air, uh, flying and you could hear people on the radio, um, you know, these guys, you go, what do you say? And that, you know, that, that was always one of those things where my instructor said, if you, if you're not sure what somebody said, you better get your head on a swivel 
because they, they're liable to hit you. They might be somewhere in the pattern and you don't know where they're at. So start looking. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, as we transition into you getting into operational flight, what, um, can you give us some context for what it was like being a pilot in the early eighties, right? So it's gotta be height of the cold war 10 years after, not, not 10 years exactly, but Vietnam has passed. You're probably training with a lot of Vietnam vets. Um, did you feel like, all right, we might get into dogfights in the next 10 years or how did that feel for you guys or what did it look like going forward? That's a great question. Uh, I would say first about um, we did get trained by a lot of uh, of the Vietnam era uh, pilots. Uh, that was, you know, they were they were now the senior elders in, in flight school or, or pilot training, uh, fighter leading and places like that. Um, one of the things that it was a myth, it wasn't there was no valid truth to it. But, uh, you know, every all of us young lieutenants believed it was uh, if, if they were, if they got you to wash out in, in a particular program, then that instructor had a chance to go to a, a new generation fighter. Remember, this is a generation that flew, you know, the F4 for the most part and A6s, uh, A4s, things like that. And, and my group, here we are, we're going to the F-15, F-16, uh, A-10s. So we were going to new jets. And so there was a there was a uh, there was a myth that was out there that if they if you washed out somebody would get your jet. Uh, so you, you definitely didn't want uh, to give anybody a chance. So you know there was a lot of uh, go go get them isms uh, to to do good, um, and that caused uh, to a certain degree a lot of uh, what I call washouts. Uh, the number of students that made it through pilot training was generally less than 50% of your class. Wow, uh, really? Yeah, and, and again, the floodgates opened up for applicants, but the, the, the requirement bar also went up too. And so uh, things that um, might, well, things that did wash people out back in the 80s, today they might say, oh, we'll give you a medical waiver for that. Uh, we'll try and find something, you know, something else in aviation, you know, so uh, you know, it, it was a little bit of a, uh, it was a little bit of a, uh, I don't want to call it a bloodbath, but there was tension in the air uh, about making sure you pass your program. There was also, uh, you know, the, the, the post-Vietnam era, you know, they were your mentors. So they're the ones who taught you some of the new Air Force traditions. So party suits, you know, long Friday nights at the club, uh, you know, things, things that, you know, probably weren't, uh, uh, I guess, the, the, the healthiest for your, for our livers at the time. Uh, you know, that became part of the, the day-to-day, you know, dialogue. And so yeah. uh, I, you know, I know for a fact, and I've been blessed, you know, my wife stuck with me and, uh, and she put up with a lot of uh, fighter pilot crap, but I know a lot of guys and gals out, or most of the guys who, uh, you know, they, they started their Air Force career with, uh, with one spouse and they've been through three or four because of those, some of those uh, fun traditions, as we would say. So there was, uh, there was some interesting times in the 80s, um, but I, I will say that it was also awesome because as we were getting new, uh, new hardware, new, new jets, and new capabilities, then things like red flag came up, you know, where you had these massive flying exercises with w- multiple weapon systems. And you really did uh, get to learn from some of the guys who, who experienced the Vietnam flying, you know, w- close to what it was like to fly combat. And, uh, and I, my personal uh, testimony is that, you know, the opportunities that I got to go at, to Nellis and at Cope Thunder in the Philippines, uh, th- those opportunities that I, did, I got to do multi-weapon system exercises and training was ultimately what made uh, going to real war for me when it was Desert Storm. Um, uh, I'm not going to say it was easy uh, because I can guarantee you that the color of my shorts was different every time I landed. 
but uh, <laughs> but uh, it was it was calming because what you were seeing happen in the air, uh, everything from large force communications to radar discipline to things that that saved lives. Uh, those were the same things that we learned and we debriefed when we were at Nellis. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the F-15 community, uh, one of the things that we uh, prided ourselves was in, in not having a blue on blue frat. Matter of fact, that if you were in red flag and you had a blue on blue frat, that was usually a hundred dollar fine that you had to put into the pot. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, so it was economically a, a, a reason and an incentive but it yeah. also drove the behavior that ultimately you got to follow the rules of engagement and you can't be shortcutting those rules. Um, and, and I, I attribute that, that and other exercise training activities of Nellis to what made us uh, as successful as we were uh, in desert storm. And then uh, eventually in the Kosovo campaign. What is red flag? So Red Flag uh, was is a program that is is flown out of Nellis Air Force Base. Okay, Nellis is uh, used to be called the home of the fighter pilot. Now it's uh, the home of the warrior because all the all the warriors come there and they earn their PhD in in the dis, in the flight in the program that they're flying. Uh, everything from tanker pilots to bomber pilots to Raptor F twenty two pilots. Everybody in the Air Force and then now. Air Force and Navy, and now coalition, they go there and they they go through a two week period where the aggressors, the flying aggressor squadron, uh, they they start to develop scenarios where you are you you start to fight against the third generation fighters, fourth generation fighters, and then now fifth generation fighters, and then you start introducing all of the other complexities. Of, of the battle. So you generate the fog of war uh, without anybody ever shooting a real missile. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of guys and gals who have died um, because of, of some of the things that they were doing um, right or wrong, but the consequence was, you know, midair or, uh, you know, collision with the ground or something like that. So Nellis is not a, a vanilla environment. But it, it, the goal of Nellis and Red Flag was to give everybody the feeling of what the first, you know, four to six days of combat might feel like. Yeah. And uh, and they and they did a damn good job. They got it. In my opinion, they got it, <laughs> and they continue to do it. You know, nowadays, yeah. you know, they're adding synthetic uh, targets into the scenario. They're adding uh, displaced uh, simulators playing with real fighters. I mean, it is leading edge technology, wow. helping you to prepare for uh, when you strap it on and, and you go master arm hot. That's, that's the key. If you never go master arm hot, your heart rate is always gonna be pretty calm. But <laughs> I can tell you every time I went master arm hot, there's no way that, that I could have registered. You know, I, I wear a Fitbit now to, to make sure that my, I keep my heart rate down low. There's no way that my Fitbit would have even been able to track my heart rate if uh, it, it, on day one of, of combat ops. I mean, I was, I was my heart rate, uh, probably, probably none of the doctors would want you to be flying under those conditions. <laughs> is it literally, when you say master arm hot, is it literally a flip of a switch? Yeah. It, and well, and every, it's, it's game on at that point. Yeah, that, that's your main one. Master arm hot means all your weapons are hot. You hit that pickle button and something's coming off the jet. Um, oh, man. So yeah, all right. It's, it's it's literally that easy. And so, just I don't know if it's even worth diving into, but you move from the A10 to the F15 eventually, pretty early on. It seems like hard transition, or no? It seems like maybe maybe you were looking for that F15 all along. No, it was a it was a another again uh, another hard transition. It, it took me two years to get to be pretty good. Uh, and credible in the hog, um, and then uh, and then when I, you know, you got to remember the A10 is a visual airplane. Everything is done by looking outside. You know, uh, different dynamics as far as the flight environment. Now in the F15, you strap on a big, huge radar 
that's the size of a Volkswagen and you can see out beyond 100 nautical miles and you're trying to process four inches of, of glass into you know 100 miles of radar view and then fly formation, you know, you're flying at supersonic speeds, you're pulling nine Gs. I mean, it was a different world. And, and again, same thing, you know, about two or three sorties into the F-15. I didn't need my instructor to tell me that I wasn't cutting the mustard. I could feel it already as a fighter pilot. I could see that, you know, you know, my, my grade sheets that I used to have in the, in the A-10 as I was getting better were all threes and fours. Now my grade sheets were ones and twos. I'm going, uh-oh, you know, so I better get my game going. So I did a lot of sit time again, a lot of sitting down with, you know, some of the legacy, the older heads in the F-15. Um, and, uh, and so, it, it, again, very different mission, A-10 to F-15. So even the mission thinking, uh, was was part of my uh, part of my you know learning. Um, the the biggest challenge too was, you know, at, now I'm a senior captain, you know, mid level captain. So they're going to start giving you responsibilities as an officer in that arena. When you really want to be, let me just study and and get better at what you what my job is. Well, you know, you you have an officer job and you got a fighter pilot job. And, and you better do them both pretty darn well, or you're going to be, as my as my squadron commander would say, you'd be flipping burgers at Burger King. <laughs> I, I got to say, in the Army aviation community, it's very rare for somebody to switch air, airframes. In that case, do, do people look down on someone who's come over from another airframe, from like an A-10 to an F-15? Is there any of that stigma? Oh yeah, and that happens in <laughs> that happens in in, in weapon systems. Uh, you know, you got to prove your, you know, you got to prove your wear. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, and, and you don't want it any other way. You, you really can't take the, you know, your, your experience and your laurels uh, from flying an A-10 and then walk into an F-15 squadron and say, okay, guys, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. You know, you, you're just asking for, for an ass whooping right there. And so, but, you know, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, throughout that journey, uh, once you, and, and, and this is very typical of, I think of all aviation, uh, once, once the, you know, there's a, there's a bar that gets you uh, is your start point. Everybody sets to that first bar, but the minute you start to bump that bar a little bit, they're not going to just leave it there. Someone's going to move it up and they're going to move it up and they're going to move it up. Um, and then ultimately, I, that's where you get a squadron of you know, 28 type A personalities that can literally, you know, you know, go anywhere and get the mission done, um, bring everybody home, you know, and, and then and ultimately have some fun, too. And uh, and, and that's really the uh, the the mentality. Uh, of, of, of what I, when people say, well, what's it like to be a fighter pilot? I go, it's not about the jet you're flying. It's about your, your willingness to, to, to go to that first bar and prove that you could stay there. And then without you noticing it, someone just keeps moving the bar up and they keep moving the bar up and you just keep performing and keep performing. And, and when you don't meet that standard, someone's tapping you on the shoulder and saying, Hey dude, um, are you okay? Because you didn't do real well in that last sortie. Um, and, and you have to have that kind of uh, what I call thick skin. Uh, most people don't do well in the, in the fighter world, I think. Uh, it's because they don't bring thick skin to the table. And again, I, I tie this all back to the sports arena. Uh, you know, when you went to your first peewee football game or little league baseball, you know, you didn't hit a home run. You didn't turn a double play. You didn't kick a field goal. You had to learn from the basics. Uh, but the minute your coach saw you doing a little bit more, okay, maybe, you, maybe you're not going to be the tackle anymore. They're going to move you in to be the center. Or maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you're going to be the full, you know, something is the next challenge based on what you're, what you're bringing. So the sports played out a lot in, in my psyche. Um, and help me uh, help me to get to where I, where I got to, you know, to to find that extra gear to, to work work a little harder to to try and get it right. 
Um, yeah. and, and, and again, you, you have to realize that you're not many guys uh, get it right and keep it right their entire career. You're going to have gr great days in the air and you're going to have bad days in the air. You just hope that those bad days don't cause you know, a midair or somebody, something tragic where you really do regret it for the rest of your life. Yeah. So maybe now if I read, you got to fact check me on this, Rico. It, it looked like your first experience in combat may have been Panama, in fact. Well, yeah, it was the Panama campaign. Um, we were sitting at, uh, at Eglin Air Force Base and then the F-15s were tasked to sit off the coast of Cuba and cap there, allowing the American uh, strike packages uh, to to fly into into Panama. So it was the Panama operation. Um, you know, it's the first time that we uh, loaded live weapons on the jet. Okay. It was the first time we opened up an air tasking order. We carried classified crypto. All the things that you train. And yeah, that was the that was our that was my first. Uh, first hurrah, if you will. Uh, and again, uh, from that day to night one in Desert Storm to night one in Kosovo, uh, the, you know, the same experiences of uncertainty, excuse me, you know, uncertainty, doubt, you know, confidence, cockiness, all that stuff is jumbled into, you know, uh, who you are. And you've got to find a, you've got to find a way of grounding yourself. And for me, uh, the grounding was really um, it, once you did the normal habit patterns that you're used to, that, that helped me ground, you know, kind of get back to, okay, let's, let's calm this down a little bit. Yeah. Did, did you end up flying during Panama? Were you actually up in the air with the aircraft fully loaded? Was that the first time you did that? Yeah. Or was that a desert storm? No, it was Panama. Yeah. And so we capped off the coast of Cuba and and we waited and, you know, there was never any activity by any of the Cuban MiGs uh, to even, you know, get airborne or try and intercept us. Uh, and so, uh, and, and again, it kind of felt uh, both exhilarating, but at the same time, you're, you're kind of wondering, okay, you know, if the Cubans did fly, what was I going to do? You know, yeah. how, how was I going to respond? And that's, you know, uncertainty is always there. Um, you know, in all phases of, of life. Um, but, you know, this is kind of one of those times when you go, okay, this is my Super Bowl. Do I, do I get to suit up coach? Okay. Yeah. yeah I got, to, I got to suit up. I got to strap on the jet. Um, it's just, just so happened that the, uh, the other guys said, eh, I'm not going to play in this game. I mean, s seriously, Rico, I mean, you were there for Panama, Desert Storm and Kosovo. Like I'm sure not everybody who was there at the time got to suit up for all of those. So I would imagine like um, just being able to be one of the people that was there probably said a lot. I, I'm curious at the time, uh, I guess, looking back, you would think there's no way the Cuban air force could, could handle what we're doing like a Cuban make. Did you have that feeling at the time? Like we are superior to this other air force potentially? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to answer that question, what I would call, uh, we trained day in and day out to a very high level as a United States Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy, every time we, you know, I don't think we, you know, uh, I'm going to say that, I mean, uh, collectively, our training level was a pretty high, high level. Uh, and we tried to always replicate the, the the biggest, baddest threat um, within the boundaries of what's going on. Um, I have to believe, and I've always believed this in my in my flying career, that there's another Rico on the other side doing the same thing. Got it. And and that he or she, uh, the last thing they want to do is 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 you know just do a belly flop on the uh, on the on the little kid pool. Uh, this wasn't the little kid pool. This was the big kid pool. And, and nobody wants to belly flop. Um, and, but I, I'm a firm believer that, uh, uh, you know, for every Rico on this side, there's a Rico on the other side trying to do the exact same thing. And so I, I, I never took that uh, uh, for granted. Yeah. Makes, makes total sense. I, yeah, I, I mean, would... 
I, I get to see the equipment now, you know, in, in my business here at Raytheon and I, and, and, and even when I was on active duty, I got, you know, obviously had all the equipment um, and you could easily say, okay, on any given day, you know, this jet versus this jet, got it. Okay. But it's really the, that human element that becomes the, the tiebreaker. And it just may be that, you know, you're going up to, against the, uh, uh, the red Baron and you just don't know it. And if you're not, yeah. if you don't have your a game, you know, he might take you out with, with his little, you know, two pea shooter. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess if we transition to desert storm, um, take it any direction you want. I, I want to hear about the, uh, the air to air. Um, but was there a time before you had your first, um, shoot down? Did, did you go up against another aircraft prior to that? Or was that the first time you were air to air with another aircraft? I'm, and the reason I ask, I'm interested in how it felt the first time you were doing what you had been trained to do, whether that was your your air to air shoot down or it was just you had an engagement and broke contact. Yeah, that was the first uh, hostile uh, contact uh, on my radar scope that I was master arm hot in Desert Storm. Um, you know, the the night of the 16th of January, the guys, uh, you know, that went out on night one, um, I was coming back, landing on the last, quote, Desert Shield sortie. Um, and then, of course, you know, we were trying to see if there was uh, anybody was paying attention to us. Um, and then, but the, the guys who went out on night one, uh, we didn't get a We didn't get a chance to sit down and debrief with each other. Because you, you know, basically, uh, you know, we were flying at such a high ops tempo that, uh, you know, you, you, in my case, uh, we we broke up wing uh, roommates, so you weren't both in the same flying window, and so when you went to your room, you could sleep, and then you know, so there was minimal yeah. disturbance. Um, but yeah, there was no. Uh, that was my first encounter, uh, and you know, uh, again, a lot of it. Uh, uh, a lot of it was because I had a, a, a recording device in the airplane, I was able to put a lot of the story back together. Uh, but, you know, mental or physically, some of the, the things that my hands did uh, going into afterburner when I did punching off the jettison, the jettison button to jettison the tanks when I did uh, things like that. I can't tell you that I did it, uh, but I can look at my video screen from the from the mission and go, okay, there's the signal. Okay, you obviously reached up here, yeah. you you hit that button, and now all of your tanks came off. It's oh, by the way, it just so happened, you know, you your next maneuver, you know, you pulled ten and a half G's, so you wouldn't have been able to do that with those tanks on there. So you knew this was happening, yeah. um, and so it validated in a major way, uh, all of the training that we had done both in, in real flying against other, other weapon systems or in, in the simulator, because in the simulator is the only place that you actually get to hit, you know, the pickle button, uh, and watch the synthetic missile fly off the airplane. You know, you get to hit the jettison button and all of a sudden the airplane feels a lot lighter and you can pull nine G's. All those kind of things only happen in certain environments and it, I was, you know, very happy um, at the end of that mission when I could finally sit down, you know, and calm down and 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 kind of go through as many of the memory yeah. bits that I had that I go, you know, this this really was about uh, everything that I had trained to do. Can, can you walk us through just what that that engagement was like and? and I, I was a, an army aviator, so I have no idea the speeds, what it was feeling like. I'm just super interested to hear, that especially like it had been years, I'm sure, since somebody had been in an engagement like that. So I, I can't imagine the heart rate at that time, but just talk me through what was happening. You had a wingman, I presume. Was it just two of you? Was it four? Who were you going up against and how did it play out? Yeah, so uh, the actual engagement, it's two of us. Uh, my wingman, Craig Underhill, his nickname, his call sign was Mole. So you can figure out Mole, Underhill, blah, blah, there you go. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, again, another one that was very politically correct. Yeah, that's uh, tame. Yeah, very tame. But um, so Mole and I were were flying. We were southwest of Baghdad. Uh, we had MIGs in front of us uh, who had kind of came. They came at us, and then they they did a drag and a beam maneuver to basically pull us, uh, continue to pull us into into Baghdad, and basically that part of the trap was what we would call a SAM trap, a surface to air missile trap. Because now as we get into a certain point, uh, all of a sudden the air, the surface launch radars light up, your, your radar warning receiver looks like a Christmas tree. And next thing you start to see is telephone poles flying all around you. Uh, that's, that's the trap. Luckily we didn't make it into the trap, uh, but we, made, we didn't make it in the trap for one reason. One, uh, one of the AWACS controllers who was uh, my original controller uh, six hours ago in that in my in the flight in the in the period of that flying day uh, he was he was monitoring western AWACS the western AOR that controller uh, was the one who called on guard frequency to my flight that says hey we have a pop-up 330 for six for uh, uh, three 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 zero for eight which was almost off of my left wing so we could not see that threat anyway on on radar and so when he said that and i realized where 330 was you know i i really had not not very many options this is when i selected jettison i rammed the jet to a 330 heading put the radar in a position to find the threat found the threat and now I realize he is eight miles in front of me. And when you're both going at 450, 500 miles an hour, eight miles is literally seconds. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, when, when I start that maneuver and find that threat, um, you know, part of the rules of engagement um, uh, required several steps to make sure you weren't firing against a friendly. And one of the rules that was written at the time was anything inside of 10 nautical miles had to be visually identified because the F-15 has some unique capabilities. And, um, and there were other platforms in the, in the coalition that uh, didn't wanna be detected, but we could. So without getting classified, that was a, that was a standing rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so by default, I was, I was not cleared to shoot um, and, you know, I, I guess I could have declared um, defensive. I'm hot. The, the, this guy is committing a hostile act against me. But the real truth was, is I still had an out. And, I, and so I took the out, which was from 30,000 feet down to about 500 feet. I, I split S the jet and went straight downhill. Uh, and then my Reaper, wingman. What, what's a split S, if I can ask? A split S is if, if, if I'm going east to west okay all right and then i roll the airplane upside down and then pull down and now instead of pointing west i'm now pointing east again that's a split s got it so okay. it, it looks it looks like a uh it's it's a half it's a half a circle okay but i i turned it around the other way um and then i not only did i turn it down the other way I actually stopped and then went straight down so I could get below the, the enemy's plane of motion, his radar field of view. Okay. Uh, again, all of these things are tied to what you learn uh, at Red Flag, what you learn about uh, the, the threat, the weapon systems capabilities of all the jets that are out there. And then as I'm doing that maneuver, I'm handing, I'm handing off that threat to my wingman through a radio call it says, hey, there's a guy off my nose, blah, blah, blah. He locks into that guy. And now he starts to do the ID matrix to make sure it's not a hostile, to make sure it is a hostile, not a friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the process of that handoff, now my job is to defend, keep that enemy from shooting at me. And my wingman's job is to complete the matrix and then take a shot against that guy and make sure that his shot doesn't include me in his field of view. Um, so it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit of a ballet 
with uh, playing the piano and pulling nine G's at the same time. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of hard. <laughs> um, Rico, quick, just before you keep going, it's so you hand the target off to your wingman. Was that hard to do? Because you probably don't get many of these opportunities. Or is it just you knew you had to do it? This is how what, how you were trained. This is the handoff, and that's how it goes. Yeah, the, we we have a very firm contract and roles and responsibilities in the air. Uh, we know when you are the supported fighter and when you are supporting. Um, you know, and so we make sure that that part is is a hundred percent crystal clear before we strap the jet on. Yeah. So that's what the briefing is all about to understand the roles and responsibilities. Um, so there was never a doubt. And again, uh, now that I am, I've, I've gone from offensively, potentially offensively looking at the threat to now I'm defensively reacting. There's a different role. Uh, I'm defensive. He's still offensive. He's got to do that job. Get this guy off of me and, oh. uh, and go from there. Uh, okay. the, the, the kicker is, is I'm trying to get below his plane of motion. I'm trying to get down as low as I can in the dirt, if you will, so that his radar has to look through the ground clutter environment to find me. Of course, I got my electronic warfare system uh, lighting up the sky. I'm pumping out a bunch of chaff in the, in the air to, keep, to try and de decoy his radar off of me. And his radar actually does a pretty good job because I can see on my radar warning receiver uh, that the guy's still locked to me. Wow. Um, so it, it's still a threat, valid threat for me. And so now I got to do two things. One, I, I, I have to make sure I don't hit the ground. And two, I need to find this guy in the air with my eyes so that when I see the smoke trail come from his jet, then I can start to fight against the smoke trail as well as the jet. Um, and so um, uh, it took me it took me quite a while to to find him. the The truth is that the way I found him was, as I'm going straight down, uh, you know, passing from thirty thousand feet down to five hundred feet, when my wingman completes his ID matrix and he calls Fox, Fox is the indication that he's hit the pickle button. Um, I look up over my left tail um, uh, on my jet. And I see him, the missile come off of his airplane and it starts to generate a smoke trail. That smoke trail goes between my tails and comes all the way to about my right five o'clock high. Now, as I'm looking at five o'clock and seeing that, trying to keep from hitting the ground, the smoke, the missile stops burning. So it's, it's now in the coast mode, all right? And so it's not generating a smoke trail, but I follow that, that that little last bit of smoke in the sky, I follow it, I follow it, I follow it. And sure enough, off my right wing at three o'clock, at about three miles off my right wing, I see the MiG-29 pointing straight at me. Uh, so now I have a visual that helps me fight this, now fight the fight. Uh, because originally, you know, before that, I'm using all my external, my sensors that are, you know, focused on the outside, but the one that I need to use the most is my eyeball. Jesus. Um, and so now uh, as I'm, I see the MIG, I know exactly what I need to be doing to keep him from taking a shot at me. And then sure enough, my wingman's missile hits him. Uh, and it looks like a huge giant sparkler in the sky. Um, you know, uh, not much of a fireball, but a sparkler. Um, and then um, as, as that event happens, I call splash one uh, on, the, on the radios. Um, and then the AWACS controller comes back and says, hey, Sitco, there's another guy 10 miles in front of you, off your nose. Um, and so now I have a decision to make. Do I look in front of me 10 miles and find this guy? Or do I turn around and run away? Um, the decision to stay and find the guy was based off of the probably the error of what the distance was that AWACS gave me. AWACS can give you a, a number, okay? And he can say that the, the, the threat is 10 miles in front of you. That number can be plus or minus three miles 
depending on where you're at. And so I said, if that threat is at seven miles and I decide to turn around, it's going to, at his speed, he's going to be three to four miles behind me. And now he has the offensive advantage because I don't have any missiles that shoot backwards. I can only shoot forward. So I tell Mole, stay, stay north. Uh, I'm at 500 feet. Mole's up at 23,000 feet. And so we, we're in a perfect bracket formation to find the MIG and, uh, and then prosecute the next attack. Um, we both lock them up. We find them. We both lock them up. Um, I get hostile. Mole gets friendly indications on his, uh, on his uh, systems that he has on board. Um, the reason Mole ends up getting a friendly is in his infinite field of view for his radar, there is a friendly in his wow. field of view, but he's getting a he's getting an IFF return uh, interrogation into his system that says, "Whoa, I don't know where it is, but there's a friendly out here, so I'm going to wow. give you an unknown." So that guy, the that friendly wasn't in my field of view. That's why I was getting a hostile. So I declared for the formation that we were going to do a VID, and then I was going to be the eyeball of the VID maneuver. And so from 500 feet up, I pass off the left wing of the MIG about 50 feet off of his left wing. I can conf 50 feet, Rico? Yeah, close. Oh. Uh, okay. We, we cross close. Um, he, he kind of continues straight as I'm going almost straight up. He's still going to the north, to the south. So I roll my airplane to the left. We go into what is considered a classic two circle fight. Um, you know, the Red Baron always said, if you turn towards your enemy's tail, then it's a two circle fight. If you turn towards his canopy, then it's a one circle fight. Um, and if you think about it, if I do this, there's two circles that uh -huh. intersect. Uh, so we start a two circle fight. Um, initially it's horizontal, um, which is the longest of the flight paths. But when I realize that he's staying horizontal, then again, I convert mine into an over the top and under maneuver. So I use a smaller turn circle than he does. And, and very quickly after about 180 degrees of turn, I am now behind his 3-9 line. I have a lot of heading crossing angle, but I'm behind his 3-9 line, and I can drive the fight to my advantage. And that fight starts around 8,000 feet, 6,000, 5,000. So we start to get lower and lower and lower um, so that the point where he's at about five or 600 feet above the ground and I'm about 1,000 feet above the ground, uh, I pull to the inside of his turn circle one more time to try and sweeten up a shot that I'm trying to take with one of my missiles. Visually, that looks a lot like I'm pulling for a gunshot, which I wasn't at the time. I was just purely trying to, to tighten up the, the weapon shot. Um, and then he tries to do a split S, kind of like what I did at 30,000 feet. He tries to do it at about 600 feet and he doesn't make it. So he hits the desert almost purely mm -hmm. perpendicular and he is in a big, huge fireball tumbling to the north, northwest of our formation. Um, but he never got out of the jet. Uh, so I, uh, I was given credit uh, by the kill board for, for maneuvering him into the ground. Man. Just quickly, I want to go back to the first MIG that's taken out. So as you describe it, you do the split S. Your wingman fires by following his his shot you identify the mig but it's pointing right at you w was that a moment of you were in a you felt like you may have been in a compromising position from well, having I, a uh, I knew i was in a compromising position because my radar warning receiver kind of gives you r a rough estimate of how far he might be based off the energy that his radar is transmitting to my jet so his the nose of his little synthetic uh, airplane was on top of my jet on the RWR. So Got I it. knew he was close. Um, so I knew, you know, my pucker factor was way high. It had to be hot, uh, so high. Yeah. 
Uh, and so now, at that point, I, I know that the the only solution is to see the missile fly off his jet. Because if I can't beat his mother radar and I can't beat his jet, then, then my last course of action is to see his missile come off the jet and then try and try and defeat that missile by literally ripping the wings off of my jet almost. So that's kind of your thought, your calculus, basically. If, if the missile doesn't hit him, which you don't know for a couple seconds, this is this is my this is my course of action. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then why, when you have that element of surprise, would you come up within 50 feet of the uh, the target on that second bird? So one of the things that you learn in, in, in peacetime dog fighting is that turning room, okay, the lateral displacement between the two jets um, is whoever owns that turning room. That turning room belongs to the, only the person who uses it, all right? And so he didn't see me. He, he never knew I was down here below him. Okay? Yeah. He's up here. He never knows that I'm here until I cross his – so the minute I cross his line and that close to him, okay, he is forced to do one or two things. If he goes up, I'm already up. If he goes straight, I can catch him pretty quick. If he goes level, okay, I can go, I can turn radial God's G to my advantage to stay smaller inside of his turn circle. If I, if I go out here and I give myself a mile separation wingtip to wingtip, and all of a sudden he sees me out there and got he it. starts to maneuver. Now that turning room is his. Yeah. And I gotta and I gotta take him back to square zero. So square zero in a dogfight is as close to each other's wingtips without hitting each other. Wow. So, so that's the that's, mentality of taking most, away turning room. That's the most advantageous position you could have been in at that point, is getting real close and then starting that process on your terms, basically. Yeah, because I couldn't shoot him pre-merge because my wingman was identifying him as an unknown possible friendly. Got it. So the, the only way to know that I, I was going to have all the advantage is to come up undetected and then take away as much turning room as possible. And that when I crossed the extension of you know his flight path going up, I could see the brown and green camouflage with the Iraqi flag. Dang. Okay. So I, I want to hear about Kosovo, but just real quick. I mean, I think there were 33 close to that shoot downs in the Gulf War, right? You, you had two, I believe, at that time. That I event. had I had two in Desert Storm and my squadron had 16. So we were the highest squadron of, of air-to-air -air victories in Desert Storm. Can, can you just kind of give some context to what that was like going, coming out of Desert Storm, pretty short window of when that took place. Like not many people were able to do what you did. D did it just give you incredible street credit going forward career-wise at that point? Like between then and Kosovo, I would imagine that that had to have been something special. In, no doubt uh, from the special standpoint, yeah. It, it it uh, it offered me some unique opportunities. It gave me the chance to go before the uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee and and testify about you know the value of red flag training and going to war. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to go to a company that I now work for, Raytheon, and and talk to those engineers about what would the next generation uh, missile need to do. To, to help me, the fighter, the warfighter, you know, do my job better. Um, but it also gave me the opportunity, which is one that I considered to me the, the most important, which was uh, to help those who would come and follow in my footsteps to prepare for their first night one. Uh, because Red Flag did, did that for me. Um, but now I could connect Red Flag to my first night one. And so I, you know, I tried to go out and, uh, and talk to all the young fighter pilots and the old ones too, because everybody learns from it. The minute you stop learning, you, you ought to get out of the business because it's a pretty dangerous business. Um, 
but uh, gave me the opportunity to just to kind of explain and think of, and ex give them in my words uh, what I uh, what I experienced. Um, and the example that I use for them is, you know, when we were in the war, uh, all the captains got together and we wrote our lessons learned from the war. And then, of course, we we had a lot of F-bombs in our notes. We had, uh, we, we were all, I think for the most part, we were all very genuine in admitting where we had made mistakes, um, you know, what could have gone better, uh, what, we, what were we not getting that we needed, things like that. We were pretty blunt about uh, our debrief. Well, uh, just like any staff action package, the captains get the, you know, put it together then it goes to the majors and the majors start to look at the spelling and then they start looking at it through the lens of an English major, uh, <laughs> not to connect majors, but they wanted sentences to, to sound like sentences as opposed to fighter pilots, you know, putting crayon to pencil. It's a paper. Uh, and then it went into the colonel's hands and the colonels were going, well, we, we really don't want to tell anybody that we didn't have any mistakes. So all the mistakes started to get out of the debrief. And then of course, when the briefing went to the general, you know, Everything was perfect. Yeah. And we go, whoa, 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 time out. It wasn't perfect. Okay. There was a lot of good things that happened. Okay. There's a lot of things that we need to learn from and not repeat those mistakes. And so I kind of considered my my give back, and I still do today, uh, to to those who invite me to 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 give them the opportunity to give back and say, listen, it wasn't perfect, um, but it was pretty damn good. Um, but if you don't take advantage of certain opportunities, then you're not going to be ready for a real night one. Uh, if you don't go to red flag and take red flag to the to the level you need to, you're going to screw it up. Uh, if you don't train hard in your own squadron, you know, if you don't train those who follow in your footsteps, you know th there can't be uh, a a differentiation of A team and B team in a squadron that is. Uh, all supposed to be a team and go forward and so uh that's kind of been my uh one of my crusades i guess i could say wow and then can can you talk me through the kosovo experience because it seems like it's a bit different and i don't want to take up a ton of your time here rico but it just i mean that's a nine year eight year difference right yeah um what was that engagement like so that engagement had the benefit of several of the, the, the things that I got to touch post Desert Storm. Um, I, I got to talk to the training community about how do we take uh, a young fighter pilot uh, at the training level and demand that they become a better fighter pilot before they get to your flying squadron. So training, check mark. We learned the lesson. We made it better. We were the beneficiary of a great training. We had a great lieutenant cadre on day one of Kosovo that was rock solid, wow. ass kicking. Uh, you know, they were a killing machine. Uh, the weapon systems. You know, when we came out of Desert Storm, we were the first squadron to operationally fly the AMRAM missile, the a A120A. Okay, by the time we got to Desert to Kosovo. Uh, we were all already flying the C model version of this of this weapon system, and it had a lot of the things that we asked for coming out of Desert Storm because this was the evolution of the of the battle space. How how do we play in that domain? Um, and, and then of course, uh, the, the, you know, I think the third thing was that you know when we got to Desert Storm, uh, or excuse me, to Kosovo, um, the the coalition that was with us, although they had a variety of different platforms, they all carried AMRAM. So they all spoke the same airman language in the air. Mm. Uh, AMRAM is one of those weapon systems that um, not only is it the most lethal beyond visual range weapon system on the market today anywhere, um, it revolutionized, not evolu it revolutionized the air-to-air -air domain because AMRAM could be used in a dogfight. It can be used in extreme long-range shots. But in order to use it, 
you had to speak the language of, uh, of, of how to employ an active missile and communicate that to everybody who's in the air. Mm. So single-handedly, much like what a machine gun did in, in World War I, uh, AMRAM revolutionized the war. So our coalition partners were also on the same sheet of music uh, as we were flying. So if I was talking about a contact off a of bullseye X, Y, and Z distance and altitude and azimuth, everybody understood what I was saying yeah. because it was driven because of how AMRAM, uh, the, that single missile uh, drove uh, uh, a common common uh, script amongst all the players. So the coalition partners, not only did they all fly AMRAM, but they'd also been to Nellis and we started to do coalition mm -hmm. uh coalition training so going to kosovo i was the beneficiary of, of of several of the initiatives that my team that my colleagues you know my squadron mates that we kind of said to other people and they took it and they ran with it and they delivered it so it was, it was pretty badass from that perspective <laughs> of, of seeing that come together in such a short amount yeah. of time um but you know, it was it was it was it was a beautiful scenario. My wingman, uh, Wild Bill Denham, was a brand new lieutenant. You know, he had gone through the training, uh, showed up at Lake and Heath in late Jan in late uh, November when the weather is terrible, so he didn't get to fly. Uh, the next thing he knows, it's you know it's the middle of February, and we get a marching order to deploy for combat ops down in Italy. So boom, we fly down to Italy. Now it's the first time he's actually getting to fly and not in, wow. not in the middle of clouds. So he's still doing his training as we are preparing uh, for, for combat ops. You know, by the time, I think it was, I wanna say the third week uh, of combat ops, he had more combat time than he had total F-15 time. <laughs> Uh, on his on his card so wow. you can you can imagine what that introduction was like but you know he 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 came prepared because of how Tyndall prepared them through through the training he yeah. wasn't he wasn't mesmerized he he was as rock solid as a 500 hour you know wingman wow um and so that was the the bonus of of how we got to fight the Kosovo campaign what was that engagement like there? Was it, it, it sounds like in uh, the Gulf War, it was daytime. Was it day or night in Kosovo for, for that engagement? So for my engagement, I was the, I was the first kill of the war. Um, and so it was a night kill. Um, it was, um, it was everything that I had trained to do in a simulator, except when I hit the pickle button, uh, one of the things that you know you you read in the in the dash the dash the manual for weapons employment it says that night do not look in the direction of where the missile is coming from <laughs> and so when I when I hit the pickle button and I looked over my left the left canopy rail the entire piece of the airplane over there was lit up by the rocket motor oh. and of course now my night blind my night vision is completely oh. gone. Um, and so I'm trying to to get my night vision back, uh, not, you know, not do anything stupid with the jet, you know, see how things are going. And the whole time, my wingman is solid. He's, he's in position, he's tracking. Uh, once I get kind of get back into normalcy, I can reference the weapon system on the weapons display. I know the missile's still flying. I can almost barely see a little, little cigarette butt out on the horizon. So I know where it's generally going. Uh, and then, of course, at that point, now the enemy's nose were there. Uh, the SAMs are starting to fly. The SAM radars are, are tracking us and everything. So now we're starting to try and maneuver away uh, from 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 the the Yugoslav SAMs, and and then let the missile do its job. And so um, it was a you know it was beyond 37 miles when Jeez. I when I took the shot. Um, and so when when the missile impacted the MIG, um, the separation between the MIG and I was in excess of 15 nautical miles. Um, so it's a completely different 
uh, spectrum. In, in Desert Storm, the longest shot was 11 or 12 miles. It was an AIM-7. You know, and so here we are in, in Kosovo putting a new weapon system into the game, and it was, it was wow. pretty much out there. Um, and, of course, when that missile hit that, that, uh, that particular MiG, um, all the mountains in, in, in that area, it was wintertime, so they were all covered in snow. So when the fireball hits, you know, the, the fireball is generated, it, it pushes all this light down, and then the, right, the light reflects up. Wow. One of the F-15E guys who, as the crow flies from my jet to, to where he was at, he was about 150 miles away from me, and he could see the sky light up from that from that fireball. God. Yeah, so it was a pretty amazing view uh, as, as the one who was closest to that fireball. Uh, it, it kind of, I tell people that it, what it looked like to me was, you know, we, you, you can imagine what you, you go to these uh, cities where you have five or six small baseball uh, uh, fields all next to each other. And it's a no moon night. You get everybody on the radio and say, I want, when I count to three, everybody turn the lights on. And that's how it, it lit up the sky just like wow. that. Amazing. So I have like a million questions I could ask. I got three more for you. One is... <laughs> One is about the last flight you had in an aircraft. Um, it can be pretty memorable for people. I'm curious what yours was like. Um, the last flight that I had in an F-15 um, was when I left Mountain Home. Um, I was the deputy ops group commander up there. And then so uh, I took the youngest kid in the squadron on my wing and then the, the adversaries were four other F-15s that were simulating uh, a fourth generation fighter. Uh, there was two F-16s. Um, and, then, um, and then so when I built the scenario, uh, I built uh, every, everybody on the red air side had to draw from a hat what their weapons loadout was going to be. <laughs> okay and and some of them uh they one they couldn't sh they were not supposed to tell each other uh okay. what their weapons loadout is but when you use fighter data link uh, and you connect the data link together i did let them use data link when you connect the data link together you can see what other people's loadout is so by by that time they kind of knew what they had but some of the guides had uh beyond visual range missiles and and but no medium range or no IR missiles. Some guys had IR missiles. Some guys only had the gun. But my wingman and I, we were a full up F-15 four by four, uh, and uh, and and the goal was to kick their ass, and we did. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah, very memorable. That's cool. Is that is that customary to have the youngest guy in the squadron on your wing? No, as, no, your last, no, you just did. It, it was just the way I wanted to do it. You know, I was the uh, oldest. Um, I was a colonel at the time, so I was the oldest F-15, uh, highest ranking F-15 guy on the base. And uh, I was going to a non-flying job. And so I said, I'll, I'll just take the youngest kid with me. And if you guys beat us, then so be it. And, <laughs> but, you know, it, it was... It was the it was it was the combination of the old and the young against yeah. uh, a very other a very skilled group uh, on the other side. Very cool. And then was there was there anything you always made sure you had with you when you were flying, like a souvenir, something somebody gave you that you always carried with you? Uh, I I didn't do that in Desert Storm uh, until literally the last couple of sorties, which weren't really, you know, they weren't contested sorties. Um, and, but when I did the Kosovo campaign, uh, I carried a, uh, a series of, of coins with me. Um, and so I, I would always, you know, when I, when I got my kill, I gave the, my crew chief a coin, um, you know, that coin flew with me on that sortie. Uh, so there was, those are some of the things, um, you know, I, I was honored to be able to carry the flag. Uh, 
but yeah, that's pretty much, you know, the extent of it. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then the last question, I think I know the answer to this one, but I, I try to ask everybody this looking back over that career that you had, um, being pushed down, like when you were going up through flight training and being told maybe you need to take a different path and A-10s to F-15s and, and the near-death experiences you had, would you do it all again? Yeah, I would definitely do it all over again. Um, but, you know, I would, I would offer to you that, um, you know, the, the kids, I call them kids, but the kids that are flying the jets like the F-35 and the F-22 today, uh, those kids, those kids are a thousand times more talented than I ever was um, in, in my best days. Um, they they bring a higher pedigree of intelligence, of uh, of commitment to to their skill set. Um, you know they they've been every generation is told by the one before them that uh, well you guys are getting it easy. We had it harder. You know we had to go to school, climb the hill both ways, barefoot in the snow. All, you know that's a typical story of but. It, but I, I, I'm a firm believer and I've seen these kids, uh, you know, I teach at the, at the uh, air to air AMRAM school here at Raytheon that is uh, for all uh, the US, uh, US Ar Air Force, Army, Navy uh, folks who, you know, are flying fourth and fifth gen fighters. Um, and, you know, the caliber of questions and the, and, the, and, the, and the calculus that they're making in their chairs to eventually translate that to taking it to the jet um it, it, it's just amazing uh so uh i'll be honest with you i'm not sure i could pass the, the test today uh the way these kids are you know uh, the, the caliber of these kids that are coming in and you know i tell them i said hey uh you got to trust what you put into training um you know i'm sure that if i had a chance uh and i've had the chance to talk to aces uh from uh, korea and vietnam I've never had a chance to talk to a World War II ace, but uh, I'm sure they would say things like trust. Um, if you if 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 you commit to, you know, always giving it your best in your training, then trust in that training. Uh, and that's kind of where I tell these kids is, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to be scared. If you're not, you should worry about that. Uh, you know, this is not uh, this is this is not uh, the NFL. This is a real sport. Uh, where people die uh nfl gets paid a lot of money to sit on their butt uh and every once in a while throw a, a nice pass but you know s combat is is very different and uh but it's it's like a sport in that you've got to practice it you got to train to it um and you got to study and and you got to study the enemy you got to study his his behaviors uh and you know you gotta you gotta do all that before you strap on the jet, um, there, there's a handful of guys and gals out there that can, uh, that that comes very natural to. It wasn't me, um, <laughs> but uh, these 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 you know some of these kids, you know they'll they they are going to do well, and and we are in good hands, if, as long as we keep giving them, you know the equipment that they need to, to out, uh, to outperform what the what the enemy is getting and the enemy is doing out there and it's that part as as you probably remember very well is not yeah i, I would say we're we're seeing an enemy force today that is um I, i'm not going to call them a near peer yet but they are very close to near peer status in uh in what they're doing in, in the air domain um uh, especially as we start to introduce uh, AI and all these other different sources out there. So, uh, um, but yeah, I'd do it again if, if I was good enough. <laughs> and, and I lied. I just have one more. If you're a 13 or 14 year old kid and you want to fly one day, you hear, you hear this story. What advice do you give them to be prepared or, or to set up for a successful career, knowing how hard it is now, the way you described the, the level of training and the caliber of this class of people? Um, I tell them that um, you need to be all in to the development of your brain, 
and to the development of your body. Um, I, I, I would say that the physicality of flying a single seat jet and pulling nine G's and, and, and doing the piccolo drill on the, on the hands-on training system. Um, there was times when it, when eight in a training scenario, uh, it was just my pure brute physical aspect that allowed me to gain that extra edge over somebody, uh, because, uh, you know, I mean, as you can see, I don't have much of a neck. Uh, I, I can pull a lot of G's and, uh, uh, and so I, I use that to my advantage. I, I would take guys to, you know, when we would do our basic fighter maneuver fights, I'd take them to the floor of the airspace where the air is thick and the jet really performs. And I'll just hold nine G's and say, come on, bring it on. And, you know, and, and sometimes that was good enough, but that's not the, you can't gorilla your way into flying, uh, and flying a victory role, as I would say. Um, so you got to develop your brain and you got to develop your body. Um, and, and, and you got to do that at high levels of both end academically, you know, you got to be into your, in, into the, you know, the academic side of it. And then physically you got to, you know, develop it, uh, uh, in, in, I, you know, I think sports is a natural way of doing it. It was for me, but there's other ways, you know, there's other, uh, physical ways of developing your body. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it, it's not about, uh, sitting in front of the TV screen and playing video games. That is not flying a fighter jet. Uh, that's a video game. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what you do in the air uh, might look the same in certain aspects, but it's not, uh, it's not what, what's going on in the air. And so uh, I think those are the two areas that I would tell kids, uh, you know, do, and, you know, again, uh, read, you know, part of the, part of that, that mental aspect is, is, is read about aviation, understand where we came from, because if you know where we came from, then you have a pretty good idea how you're going to play a role in taking us to the next level. Mm-hmm. Well, Rico, I can't thank you enough. Fascinating stories from uh, an Army aviator to hear what it was like up there. So thank you very much for the time. No, truly my pleasure. And, you know, I, I enjoyed this as part of my way of, of giving back. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. If you want to tell your own story, go to combatstory.com. If you know someone we should interview, send me their info at ryan at combatstory.com. Hearing these stories can be tough or bring back your own memories. If you're battling PTSD, please call the Veteran Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255. 273-8255. Stay safe.